Good morning and welcome to Talking Point here on WESN, the content capital. My name is Keaton Shaw. It's Wednesday, the 23rd of March, 2022. And this morning, hopefully very soon, we will be joined by our guest uh, to discuss uh, the recent prison outbreak, the visit to the prison, the Golden Grove Prison in Aruka by the Minister of National Security, Fitzgerald Hines, and the prospects or, or the possibility of um, this reoccurring in the future. Uh, quite recently, within the last five years, uh, there have been quite a few uh, prison outbreaks and uh, it's something that we really need to get the bottom of because uh, it's all easy to have discussions, talk is cheap, what's actually done about it and exactly where does the blame lie. And then later on in the program, we will get the opportunity to explore and discuss what the Minister of Finance stated yesterday in relation to foreign exchange reserves. Um, is he positive? Is he negative? Well, only you can tell based on his response. And then after that, uh, if we have enough time, we need to speak about fraudulent land deals here in Trinidad as well as public sector corruption. That is the reason, at least part of the reason, for the former Minister of Agriculture, Clarence Ramrat, former government senator, for tendering his resignation. Alongside me this morning is my co-host, colleague and good friend, Mr. Sean Michael Small. Good morning, Sean. Good morning, Keaton. And it's, a, it's an interesting day because I guess you could say finally the new cycle has come down a little bit. We could breathe. We don't necessarily have any big controversies. We're just dealing with the, the lingering effects of all of the things that happened over the last week, week and a half. Um, except the Prime Minister uh, last night did announce the intention of full reopening. Mm -hmm. That's on the horizon, it's on the table now. Um, when exactly it will be done, I don't think he gave a, a, a time frame looking, or committed to anything. He's looking as soon as possible. He said later this week he will be meeting with officials uh, from the Ministry of Health right. in order to have discussions. And he says he doesn't see any reason as to why we should remain closed. We need to reopen. You're right. And the, the, all signs point to things being, being well, the public health um, sec, uh, system, the, pub, the parallel healthcare system. It's been so long since I've had to say that phrase. It's um, the numbers there have been dropping. And that was one of the main indicators where the government used to determine if they need to use more stringent measures or not because if that collapse that's usually the sign just before things getting seriously bad in a country so we have more or less relatively good signs and while there is increased covid in other parts of the world there's no practical reason to expect that to happen here so not saying that it can't happen but for the most part, it's reasonable to think that unless something changes, we should be okay. And unfortunately, as, as we've said, as much as six months ago, or maybe, or maybe more, you know, the need for the economy to be fully open so that certain businesses could get back on track and start earning revenue and catching up in some cases with their bills for the last two years, you know, it needs to happen sooner rather than later. I don't want to get too caught up in the conversation of COVID-19. Um, I mean, we've really exhausted that topic and not saying that we should never push um, the need uh, for that particular conversation to continue. Um, but there's so many other things to discuss and you and I get caught up very easily. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, very quickly, in your opinion, do you think we've been very fortunate? I mean, throughout the pandemic, we've, we've had instances where there were threats uh, and great threats that the parallel healthcare system was on the verge of collapse. And many individuals stated their opinion that the numbers were all falsely, uh, you know, falsely generated in order to scare the public. Um, people have been saying, well, it's obvious that the government uh, really is conflicting themselves. Many of times, uh, we, mm -hmm. I mean, up to SA, you and I were discussing probably some of the conflicts associated with government ministers and COVID-19. But for the most part, we've been rather fortunate when you look at Trinidad and Tobago's story compared to the Caribbean, as well as the rest of the world. Well, I think there are other islands who, at the end of the day, they came out of it about as fine as, as, as you could have hoped because they're dependent on tourism. Uh, we interviewed at least one doctor, and there's also the fact that the healthcare system has so much employees 
that for you to commit fraud on that level, you know, more than one person is probably going to have to know. And we know that the initial reports from Kuva, when that was the main and only facility, they were more or less being truthful with regards to that. And you could extrapolate a little bit. It's not as though we had um, some fantastically large infection number and, 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 and the, 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 the sort of alarm bells that they were ringing were unreasonable and, and sensationalized things. Because the doctors who were reporting on the numbers, at times they always try to manage our expectations of what was going on. Okay, this is relatively bad, this is relatively good, this is what we could do to hold on, etc., etc. They will give warnings. And if anything, I would say that most of the time, because they would warn when we had the risks of, of spikes, when the, just before the spikes happened. And we didn't really have a change of behavior, and then the government would actually have to you know, change the regulations and force our behavior patterns to change in order to make sure that the surges don't get out of hand. So, uh, no, I, I think the reporting more or less was fine. Conspiracies like that generally don't work. It, it, it just, that's how we know of them. Well, certainly, uh, I, I think just based off of uh, the outlook globally as well as around the Caribbean, and you're right, pointing out that around the Caribbean, there are other countries that uh, certainly have done better than we are, but uh, considering the size of our population, the number of COVID-19 cases and the spread, well, even in relation to the actions and behaviors of, of, I think of members Kong, of the public. Hong Kong within this year, which is not that long, has maybe doubled our death rate or come close to that because it's over 6,000. Yeah. So, you know, we're not bad, especially because it goes back to what I said yesterday about governments and resources and the lack thereof. Well, I think, folks, uh, that even though the Prime Minister has indicated his intention to reopen the economy, uh, well, not just the economy, but Trent Bego, uh to uh, pre-pandemic conditions uh, very soon as he meets with officials from the Ministry of Health, we do have to bear in mind as well that uh, we are still in a pandemic. There are still public health regulations that are in place. And whether or not you like it, whether or not we agree with it, as well as perhaps the contradictory messages that we receive at times, they are there to maintain law and order. And we ask you to do the right thing. We encourage you to practice best health uh, procedures. And of course, going forward, we just keep our fingers crossed and hope for the very best. But uh, this morning, we're waiting for our guests to join us, uh, but we will start the conversation. We cannot waste much more time on this. Uh, let's start off by uh, talking about uh, the prison break. It's a topic of which we uh, did touch on a bit on Monday and really explored at length yesterday. But uh, the latest development is, is uh, whilst uh, four of uh, the five have been They've been recaptured. One inmate uh, remains at large. The manhunt continues for them. But the Minister of National Security, Fitzgerald Hines, yesterday visited the dorm in which uh, those five prisoners escaped. And he has indicated, well, he's promised uh, to strengthen the security in that area, stating that plans are underway, which includes improving infrastructure. Now, this is all well and good. I'm actually very happy to see the Minister of National Security visiting the actual dorm as to where this took place. Um, I don't know if it's the reporting, um, because it, it's not in quotation marks, um, but the minister said plans are underway to strengthen security in this area. Whether or not he was speaking specifically of that dorm or the infrastructure of a whole around the prisons in Trent Tobago or just at Aruka, that is a bit of a concern that probably needs to straighten out. Again, that could just be the reporting on the part of the article. But more so, the minister Sean, has promised to strengthen security in this area, stating that how national security has been of utmost importance. Now, that may be the case, and I, I like the words I'm hearing from the Minister of National Security. My only concern is that uh, too often do we hear these wonderful, wonderful promises and, and not often do we actually see anything tangible taking place. Uh, ironically, I had a, a, a question via social media from one of our viewers asking, you know, why is it that we're so hard on the Minister of National Security, Fitzgerald Hines? And I had to respond truthfully. Unfortunately, I don't have anything that I could say that he has done that, 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 that has contributed to his portfolio. 
technically speaking, the only thing that he has reported that I could remember. Maybe he was there when we when they opened a new station or whatever, and he and he and he told us about the new boats um, within the first week that he was given the portfolio. But within the first week, when you're saying that new boats are on their way, well, you don't negotiate, have it constructed, paid for, and shipped within your first week. That would have been done before facilities that you might have been a part of commemorating their opening that would have been in construction before and ironically while i don't necessarily think this is a reason to say we need to bring back um commissioner griffith you heard more of 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 the police back when he was the commissioner of what was being done like Granted, there was a lot that, that, that was not done with regards to, okay, what about hard drugs, large drug shipments? What about arrests with these interdictions of, of drugs and guns coming into the country? What about arrest of, of the crime lords, not just maybe the foot soldiers? So now he's saying nice words. Nice words are nice words. All politicians have nice words. Not all politicians are elected. He was elected. And the, the question with regards to prisons is it seems to be a long-term problem. So I would assume we had nice words about prison infrastructure being improved to prevent this sort of thing before. There was a violent, um, you, you said it five years ago or, or more, there was a violent situation with regards to breakouts. So didn't they not look at the prisons? I think recently they found uh, just outside the perimeter of the prison fence. Um, buried with, with uh, weapons, I think grenades as well, um, that they found buried outside the, the okay, prison. Okay, well, all right, and, and that's good because, uh, you know, that's probably something that was done relatively recently to that discovery. They found it, they prevented it from, so that's, that's good news. But with regards to the facilities, if there is any sort of deficiency, we had an escape. First of all, we had an escape years ago. Was, was any sort of work done to see, okay, how could we improve the situation? But more importantly, you know, shouldn't you be looking at your facilities on a, maybe an annual basis? Mm. Well, uh, yes, fair enough. You must be looking at your facilities on an annual basis. And I don't doubt that the infrastructure within uh, the prisons are, are poor. Uh, to put it very lightly, no. I, I mean, generally speaking, for the most part, uh, the more or less uh, older government buildings uh, are poorly maintained. So that, for me, will say, okay, this is a government office; it's poorly maintained. I can only imagine the conditions yeah, inside prisons, there. Prisons, prisons, you don't, you're not relying on those walls of a government office to keep in. No, no, no. I, I completely understand. I'm just making the comparison in terms of uh, the actual maintenance. So you're right in saying that, but I'm saying if we disregard that, imagine the disregard that is associated with the maintenance, the upkeep of the infrastructure of the prison. Now with that, interestingly enough, I think that it's all well and good to say that we are going to improve the infrastructure of the prisons, which is needed. I mean, I go back mm -hmm. to when I was on another platform before joining this program, uh, in which I, I did speak to the former commissioner of prisons, Dennis Pulchon, when he was acting as commissioner of prisons. Right. And he indicated that, yes, there is a serious problem with this. And he said he has been speaking to the then minister. I think the uh, minister then was Stuart Young, if yes, I'm not mistaken. Yes, it would have been, yes. Um, and, and he's stating that, um, but, but at the same time, no report was ever generated on this. And I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, the process for this, our reports, official complaints need to be made and reports need to be generated. For me, you cannot only, in order to strengthen this area, target the infrastructure. You also have to target the security that's on the ground, the static security, which are the prison officers. Up to this point, based off reports, it stated that they cut BRC wire. And this is a point I'm not, not going to let go. Exactly where did they get the necessary equipment? Because as rusted as BRC is, you'll still need at least bolt cutters to cut that wire in order to get out. Well, the only thing is, I'm sure with regards to prisoners, who have time, if you could expend enough time, there might be some sort of creative way to hide that could be hidden, that they could use to cut the wire. It should, we should still, however, you know, get some sort of answers. Now, maybe that's not something they want to publish because they don't want to give anyone else any ideas. And, I'll, and, and that will be somewhat understandable. However, to some extent, you know, we do need some sort of explanation 
um, with regards to that. And, and usually, if you know what it is, then it's not something that, that another batch of prisoners could or should rather be easily replicated. So maybe you could reveal it to the public so you could explain to us, because I'm sure a lot of people have that question. Now, let me be fair. In, in this instance, some of the things with regards to um, the Minister of National Security, he's only been there for a year. This is generally an inherited problem. So I will give, I usually say that for a lot of other situations, you know, so I think we should say that here. Granted, he has been there for a year, so you do have to ask, well, why hasn't he fixed it in a year? This, unfortunately, similar to Ministry of Education, could be a situation where it's budgetary constraints, and you kind of have to go through cabinet. Cabinet has to approve because, and this is the unfortunate part, because we've seen this with regards to maintenance in other areas of the public sector. I mean, the PTSU buses might be what, what comes to mind for most people when I say maintenance, but for me, it's the ferries and how the ferries degenerated um, seemingly quickly because maintenance was affected and it affected the performance of these boats, which, you know, you can't just, you can't just tune up in your house garage and expect it to run to Tobago four times a day and be fine. This is a prison wall. It's not, the, like I said, it's not like any other government office where, okay, maybe if, if, if a window, a window pane is broken or a door is, it doesn't close properly, that's right. No, all of the doors have to close properly. All of the walls have to be secure. All of the fittings and fixtures can't be loose. Here's where I will uh, humbly disagree with you uh, in stating that it's an inherited problem. Perhaps he has uh, only within well, the last year. Well, remember, it was spoken about no, from no, Mr. Uh, to, to uh, Minister Young. Yes, I, I understand that. And, and yes, he's been in the rule uh, for, for a year, if so much. Uh, furthermore, you would think that uh, Minister Young would have, at least in terms of the transition from that ministry to the Ministry of National Security, mm. uh, at least updated or advised the current Minister of National Security on the ongoing issues, at least the complaints that are at hand, uh, and areas that uh, they were really looking at, uh, if that was an area that they were really focusing on. But more so, the reason why I say that we shouldn't let this be an inherited issue as an excuse is the mere fact that this is not the first time that we're hearing of this. Well, uh, the minister has been a parliamentarian for how many years, and furthermore, he has been uh, part of this particular government for the last, well, this particular government for the last year and a half, and for the previous administration before this government for five years. So in calling it an inherited situation is very easy. And it just, in my opinion, gives good leverage in terms of an excuse. But at the end of the day, it's very poor, especially knowing that uh, at the end of the day, how long has this particular issue been plaguing us? Well, and it goes back, and this is, this is where now you have to again go beyond party. It goes back to maintenance. Um, and that's why I said, I think it's a budgetary thing ultimately speaking, because every ministry has things that they want to do, and not every ministry is going to get to do everything that they want to do, and I doubt any ministry is going to get to do everything that it wants to do. The problem is prioritizing, and, and also the fact that with regards to maintenance of things, as anyone who, who has had to deal with these sorts of things on a practical level would know, the more you put it off, the more the costs will you know, accumulate, it will cost more and more to get it back to the proper state of being. Then on top of that, with facilities usually, uh, particularly with our prisons, how old are these structures, what parts of them are outdated, ne need renovating, upgrading with regards to facing um, the new challenges, like the issue with cell phones and prisoners being able to not just contact the outside, but record video, get all sorts of contraband to have parties, but, but, but part of that, undoubtedly, the fact that you have wireless communication available to you was a problem. So that's just one area where we believe with the charming towers, they upgraded it enough. Maybe, maybe not. But what else is there? Because, you know, the, 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 the facility in Port of Spain, how old is that? And, and really and truly how serviceable is that now? If we have problems just maintaining these things and it's getting more ancient by the day, it's one of the oldest buildings well, to, in Port of Spain. To be very honest with you, uh, I'm not entirely sure I'm, I'm 
uh, as to why it is that we still have a, a prison in the middle of the capital yeah, city. Yeah, I, I, and they have to deploy extra yeah, police on the perimeter. I, I'm not sure why, why that's the case. I am not in agreement with that. But I'll tell you what, Sean, let's take a break here. Let's pause here for now. Uh, this is a topic that we'll continue to explore. As I said, there, there's a lot to discuss over it. Um, but the latest is that, as I said, one, uh, the one escapee that uh, the TTPS hasn't captured as yet, uh, the manhunt continues. Um, and the Minister of National Security, well, he visited the prison yesterday, of course, uh, giving us uh, good promises and... Uh, of course, trying to pacify the situation or the concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, we will take a break now, and when we reach in, well, this morning we'll explore the conversations associated with foreign exchange reserves. Of course, it's nothing new to the program, but the Minister of Finance yesterday spoke in Senate, of which he gave an update. Stay tuned to the talking points here on WESN, the content capsule. Burning questions, urgent topics, welcome back to One on One, the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens, where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Let your voice be heard. Call Madam Fix It on WESN, the only place that effectively helps you with your woes. Having problems getting onto government agencies, water woes, NIS and pension problems, potholes, and much, much more. Call me, Madam Fix It, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, right here on WESN. Let me fix it for you. Politics, what is it? Is it that nobody cares about sports? The kind of support that sport used to get in the past is it's no longer here. The thing is, taking a knee doesn't mean that that's the only thing you're doing on it. Right. Taking a knee along with other stuff. Samantha, what are you looking forward to when you return home to try and to be go after winning the title? Thank you very much for speaking it into existence. Is it no pressure on Nicholas Paul? It makes me more motivated to work hard and to go out there and grab the right and black. Why are we sending a team to the Winter Olympics? There are a number of Trinbegonians who are in the diaspora and have grown up in winter sport. It's an opportunity that the Trin and the Olympic Committee will not close the door. I also believe in the players that we have. Once you can motivate the players, you can get the best out of them. It may seem like the hardest thing to do right now, but we all need each other to wear a mask, wash our hands, watch our physical distance, and stay at home. We need you safe. Together we can make the difference. Together we can curb the spread of COVID-19. So let's be responsible in our actions. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society. Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. As we focus on business and finance, the state of our economy, Trinidad and Tobago, of course, is uh, a major importer. Our exports do not uh, uh, really compensate for the level of uh, imports that we have. We earn foreign exchange through oil and gas and through byproducts of oil and gas, um, but that does not necessarily cushion uh, what we import, which is almost ba almost anything, basically everything when you think about it. Um, and that has always been the problem in terms of foreign exchange reserves, especially with the state of economy, the impact of COVID-19. But something that we need to bear in mind is that uh, these conditions 
existed before the pandemic and were only exacerbated by the pandemic. The pandemic has become such a great excuse now that uh, it kind of, again, gives a, a, a good reason for where we're at. Well, it's not focusing on the actions before the COVID-19 pandemic. The mere fact is, is that the issue of foreign exchange remains unsolved. We have not been able to resolve it at all. And it's going to be an issue for quite some time, seeing that we're still dependent on oil and gas. Sean, I don't see us really getting out of this hole anytime soon. Well, so the opposition brought it up, I believe both Senator Dion Ryan and Senator Mark um, had their issues with regards to foreign exchange yesterday in the Senate and the Minister of Finance was answering questions. He decided to give something of a economic presentation, if you will, um, towards the middle of the session, I believe. And he seemed to be somewhat optimistic with regards to forex situation on two fronts. One was the balance of trade situation. He um, believes there will be improvements there and, and, and pointed out what he would claim to be signs of things going up, some of which I might agree with, some of which I might disagree with, as well as the fact that he spoke on, obviously, the, the price of energy and the, the benefits that he believes that we will experience. Now, of course, it's not that simple, as you know. Now, before we do see the video of uh, the, the Minister of Finance's commentary, yes, I, I know it's not as simple as that, but answer me this question. When has the Minister not been optimistic? That's a very good question. When has he but not been positive? When he said positive? that he only had three days cover, was it three days? Three days cover within Central Bank. And maybe then he kind of laid, let's not do the sensational alarm dog whistle statements. No, I mean, if he was able... Let's be I, a bit more stable with what we say. I always go back to the fact that if he was able to do that, then he has the potential to solve a global financial crisis. Unfortunately, I think too many politicians in general... Um, they, 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 they like to speak uh, with, dr with dramatic effects as opposed to with statistical accuracy. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, uh, again, I ask, uh, when has the minister not been optimistic? When has he not sounded positive? And you often wonder if uh, that is just uh, a shade over the realities of the situation. But let's now hear from the Minister of Finance. Yeah. That Forex facility at the Exim Bank has supported companies with total export sales of $2.027 billion from January 21 to February 2022. Export sales from this same group of manufacturers increased by almost $400 million between 2020 and 2021. 17 sectors in the local, of local industrial sector of access to Forex including food and beverages, building and construction materials, packaging and plastics. The TTMA has confirmed that this manufacturing forex facility provided through the Exim Bank has enabled its members to focus on export growth, improve supply chain management, repair supplier credit relationships, reduce manufacturing downtime due to problems with inventory stock levels, expand inventory options, provide support to maintain employment levels, ensure the stability of domestic supply of goods where you have import sub substitution, and to invest in new technologies and equipment. Small businesses have received 172 million US dollars. Medium businesses have received 135 million US dollars. And large businesses have received 293 million US dollars. But of the entities, 82% of the companies fall into the small and medium s sector, micro, small and medium sector. What we've done as well, we've continued to improve this facility to provide forex to manufacturers and to align our facility with the TTMA strategy, because this TTMA has a strategy to double manufacturing and exports by the year 2025. That's their policy. The policy is now expansion of the export and manufacturing forex window to all types of businesses with an emphasis on micro, small and medium enterprises and also expansion of their forex facility to facilitate allocations to 
importers of essential items. And that is how the government can get involved. We also expect that there would be improvements in the availability of foreign exchange to the commercial banking sector from the energy sector. What we are seeing is that there is going to be significant improvement over the medium term. So we had, we had budgeted on $65 and we're getting $115. We don't know how long that will last. But the fact of the matter is we do expect enhanced forex inflows from the energy sector as a result of the increased prices. Gas prices are also quite promising. Um, we now have moved away from the dependence on the US market for the sales of our gas and a significant portion of our gas now goes to Europe and the Far East and South America, where the prices that are fetched for our gas is significantly more than the published price of Henry Hub. So that was the Minister of Finance. And it's interesting with what he had to say, because some of the claims that he made, well, I won't say claims, but he said that exports increased between 2020 and 2021. Well, what were the level of exports in 2020 for the increase? Is it that industries had to restart between that period and that's why we had the increases that he mentioned? We're not entirely sure he didn't give us the full context. Also, did we see any sort of significant growth when compared to our normal level of exports? As I said, is this us just returning to what it is we used to produce, which before COVID was not necessarily enough for us to hang our hat on and say, yes, this is going to balance off the, the, the international trade, the import-export balance of trade, so that we don't have an issue with Forex. We ha we've had an issue with Forex for quite a, a couple of years before COVID. And with regards to energy, you pointed it off, um, off air while we were watching the video. It sort of contradicts what the Prime Minister was warning about because he said, well, with higher energy prices comes the fuel subsidy problem and higher um, gas prices, which will affect our economy in multiple levels. So the thing is, though, he didn't say that this will be great for the economy and it'll be all pluses. He did say that it should help us with our forex inflows. It should be something of a net positive. He didn't necessarily say how much of a net gain for forex we will have, right? But uh, Technically speaking, um, there was more things he said. He said um, the Ministry of Trade will have a lot of uh, projects coming forward to try to improve things, including the ease of doing business. But there were a lot of details with regards to that. Now, the minister also focused on uh, expected uh, inflows of foreign exchange. Uh, what are our outflows? Have our outflows increased? Right. Especially in relation to we've had uh, drug shortages and companies are now giving preference to those who have the currency at hand, right? So you have to bear that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've now had to focus on that as well. Also, we have loans to, to repay. Bear that in mind as well. Uh, that is separated from our actual imports. Uh, I mean, part of the context is, it's nice to say that the Manufacturers Association wants to double exports by 2025, but if it's doubling a small amount, twice of small might still not be enough. So these are things that we, 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 to some extent, we need to know. But I agree with you with regards to what you said. What about the loans? Yeah, because again, the loans that we've taken are in US dollars. I mean, uh, besides the, the Chinese loan, which um, was well, quoted in euros, that in itself, I mean, is still foreign exchange, no, isn't no, it? Now, to be fair, hopefully, if these initiatives help stabilize the situation, we won't necessarily dip into the loans and we will have that currency so it's potentially. Of but I don't into know. the loans, it's repaying what we've Right, already. that's what I'm saying. So, not all of the money has been used. The, the question is was the foreign X from the loans used and we just have the value in TT dollars sitting in our accounts? Or has the forex been kept in reserve? Because he did tell we have this amount of reserve um, forex. Um, cover, it, part of it came from the IMF's um, special drawing rights. But 
you know, is the forex there? How much of the forex is there from the loans as well? well the minister also focused on the exit bank, uh, which throughout the pandemic, the government was actually pumping money into. Though, during um, the SDRs, of which he announced late last year, he indicated that we had uh, over, I think, eight and a half months import cover, if I'm not mistaken. Right. But, but uh, put that aside, the exit bank was being pumped with foreign exchange. He said so many companies accessed it, and he even said small, medium, and large businesses were able to access it. The thing is, what are those businesses? Who are those businesses? And the reason I'm asking is not to find out exactly who are the business owners. The reason I'm asking is because I think of certain things like, we have so many franchises, and I'm mm -hmm, talking about mm -hmm. excluding I food. I'm talking, uh, when I mean food, um, I'm talking about within the grocery. We have so many food franchises. We now have so many um, apparel and brand name uh, franchises that so much so, one company in particular, which has just recently opened up two stores in Trinity City Mall, they've indicated we were able to expand during the COVID-19 so pandemic. imports are supposed to be um, limited to what is necessary. Is apparel necessary? I don't know. Exports, it's more open because obviously that generally you would expect it to be a net inflow once you increase exports because you're selling to somebody else, right? But imports, this it's supposed to be limited to what's necessary, but he did not break it down. One of the things he said was he broke it down, yes, small, medium, large businesses, micro businesses. The majority of the businesses were medium, small, and micro. But I think the money, the foreign exchange distribution, probably the, the, uh, uh, not, not a large majority, but at least just as much, if not more, money was given to the large businesses alone, which I think was either one third or one fifth of the businesses he was talking about, of the whole group. So they got our over 200 million, I believe. Some of these large businesses, we have to bear in mind as well, uh, these larger businesses will have accounts in the US. Um, well, we'll have a, because if you have to have a franchise, you have to have an account in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to bear that in mind as well. But in terms of accessing the facilities by the exit bank, we have no information or details well, on that. Where is the bank getting its foreign exchange? Ex well, the, the government is pumping money into it. Right, but remember, but, I think during the COVID nineteen pandemic, the government pumped a initially two hundred million and then an extra five hundred million or some, something to that. Something but, to that but if the government is using its supply into the exit bank, then how is the energy supply going to go to the? banks because as much as okay you could say there'll be private businesses I'm sure Shell and um, BP they want to take their profits out in a foreign currency they're not gonna just keep their profits here that's that's part of the controversy of the international companies in Venezuela when their money essentially was being held to ransom you invest in order to make profits but not just to sit on those profits well, that's also another issue that uh, we could take from what the minister stated. Again, it sounds very optimistic and positive. I don't share in those. Uh, I, I don't share that light. Um, when you also look at uh, the state of our economy, and, and it goes back to certain things such as uh, crime, such as the ease of doing business, all of that. Um, established businesses. I'm not entirely sure, Sean whether or not they are interested in reinvesting their money in Trinidad and Tobago if they're mm -hmm. looking for opportunities. I think the economy... To invest outside, yeah. They said the economy is depressed. The economy is also stagnant. I think well, companies are now looking to sustain what is already the, existing. The, the, the one good news with that is, as I've said before, we are all in trouble. It's not just TNT having an economic crisis. The world has an economic crisis. Do you want to invest in Europe right now? I'm not entirely sure because we don't know what could happen. That, that's the thing. I'm not saying that there's going to be wars all over the place, but we just don't know. Economically, we just don't know with regards to what curve wall might cause a certain part of the world to have more financial problems. So the uncertainty, of course, is going to potentially slow down new investment and business growth. Um, Hopefully, though, it's, it's a catch-22, right? Because a lot of these situations do create opportunities. Those who are aggressive enough that could identify them and roll the dice and nothing, uh, another act of God does not come and, and sink their plans. Because a lot of businesses, they, they position themselves to reopen last year multiple times and multiple times they were stymied. But... Um, we, we just have to see how I that just, goes. I just very quickly, as we wrap up on this topic, I want to use one example of BHP Billington, which has indicated by, I, I believe, about June this year, they are now looking to shift their resources uh, out of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. 
and take their operations to Ghana. Um, and yes, Ghana has an oil boom right now. Um, yes. Ghana is one of three country, uh, three economies in the world that I think actually grew over the COVID-19 pandemic. So, I mean, that's understood. But this is what I'm saying. In terms of opportunity, how is it now? Uh, one thing is to look at the existing conditions, but how is it now that we are going to convince foreign investors to come to Trinidad and Tobago? And I think that is something the Minister of Trade and Industry, as well as the Minister of Finance, have failed we to actually address. How are we now looking to uh, try and tell these investors Trinidad and Tobago is a land of opportunity and there is still opportunity here in which you can invest. So here's the thing. I think though that the higher energy prices should be a net positive. I, but as the Prime Minister said, and, and we said even before he made those statements, it might not be the net positive that people would think. It's not going to be riches coming down the pipe, but we will have a little bit more flexibility and, and resources to play with than we would have had if the prices remained around the $60, $50 a barrel mark. So we have a potential opportunity, or at least we're better off to try to figure it out. But I think, yes, there are a lot of things that we have to, we have to see about. If we're gonna have, because these are long-term problems, if we're gonna have this problem with our, our society and the price of gasoline, but our public transportation system is in a mess, do we continue pumping money into a subsidy or do we try to invest long-term? So we could try to do quick investments, and, and I guess the Manufacturing Association, they are looking, and you could argue we need that, they are looking to try to, to hit the ground running and move quickly. Meanwhile, maybe government needs to look at long-term things to, to, to kind of help the situation down the road be a lot more stable and manageable than what we have now, which is transfers and subsidies well, to, 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 to ease whatever situation or difficulties well, we have, there, and that's not sustainable. I mean, the, with higher oil and gas prices uh, comes inflation, but with our current state, do you think the possibility of government increasing taxes on foreign goods and imports, I mean, they already did it on luxury items a couple of years ago, but the possibility of increasing VAT um, on, on, on these items. It, it doesn't even necessarily have to be food. We're, we're talking about imports the, the, such as apparels, imports such the, as cars. The irony is inflation is going to cause the price to increase. So if it's regards to collecting more revenue, they would already collect more revenue. If it's a way to try to um, dissuade people from buying too many luxury goods, well, the increase in price from inflation would already do Remember that. You so to, you're saying, yes, they will collect revenue, but you have to look at the correlation. Even though they'll be collecting more revenue, if there's inflation, they'll also have to be spending more. I mean, that is true, but, but the problem is, if you increase taxes again on top of multiple rounds of inflation and cost of shipping increases, you might actually reduce the revenue that you collect because less people will be buying those products to the point where you know, the, 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 the actual net gain if revenue is your, is, is your concern. If your concern is to manage Forex and to dissuade people from buying too much of certain unnecessary things, well then that's different. If that's your primary concern, they might. They might just increase taxes. Certainly. Well, folks, uh, a lot to discuss in relation to that. As you can see, there's so many angles of which you can dive into and try and analyze and assess too much for just uh, one episode of Talking Points. So you can be assured that the conversation will continue, especially when we welcome our commentator, the former Minister of Finance, Karen Yusishara, to the platform. Unfortunately, she cannot join us today because she, she had hopefully a Hopefully sometime engagement. this week. Yeah. But um, we, could, we could schedule her and she She had a prior on. engagement and she, she does apologize. She always looks forward to coming on the program. And uh, as Sean points out, hopefully uh, at a later date, be tomorrow Friday, we will have her on the platform. But for now, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. And when we return, well, let's explore state utilities this morning. I know initially I said we were going to discuss uh, uh, the situation in relation to fraud and uh, land here in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm going to pause on that topic this morning because, I, as I said, I, I look forward to Karen joining us and we can discuss that more with her. But the, the, there's progress in terms of uh, government trying to transform state utilities. There's TSTT and there's WASA to explore. So when we return, we'll just quickly look at that. Stay tuned to Talking Point here on WESN, the content capital.
Gift giving during a lockdown can still be hassle-free with a gift from FanZone with delivery options available nationwide. Visit and browse our Facebook and Instagram pages for all your official licensed merchandise and apparel and have it delivered to your door. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. FanZone, we've got you covered. The best for your baby is at thebesttoys.com. From the best strollers, car seats, baby carriers, high chairs, booster seats, rockers, jumpers and bouncers, walkers, baby blankets, feeding accessories, bathtubs. Visit us in store at Forces Flagship Magazine. Shop online now at thebesttoys.com. Order via call or WhatsApp at 332 Baby. And remember, we have the best toys at the best prices. Burning questions, urgent topics, welcome back to One on One, the show where we tackle the most current and pertinent subjects that are affecting all citizens, where we ask the hard questions and have in-depth conversations. What separates One on One from other talk shows is that the conversation stems from a younger perspective on topics that affect the fabric of our society. One on One, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. on WESN Content Capital. Join me, Sule A. Joseph, as I delve into the day-to-day -day psychological issues plaguing our society. We will discuss behaviors that encompass the biological influences, social pressures, and environmental factors that affect how you think, act, and feel. Sight, Thursdays at 11.30 a.m., only on WESN, Content Capital. Every word, every line, Every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister, a mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. It may seem like the hardest thing to do right now, but we all need each other to wear a mask, wash our hands, watch our physical distance, and stay at home. We need you safe. Together we can make the difference. Together we can curb the spread of COVID-19. So let's be responsible in our actions. The Trinidad and Tobago Red Cross Society Mission-based, people-focused, community-driven. Welcome back to Talking Point here on WESN, the content at Capital. Okay, uh, Sean, uh, with about eight minutes left, uh, there are a couple things to explore in relation to... Uh, the state utilities, uh, TST. So the Minister of Public Utilities, Marvin Gonzalez, has indicated that the government has received, or at least he has received uh, documents by the management of TST indicating plans in order to transform the business model of the utility in order to make it profitable. And TSTT has also indicated that they have already re, um, made partnerships with international uh, funding, international funding from whether it be loans or bodies, whatever it may be, they've just said international funding uh, to secure severances. Though they have not confirmed any sort of concrete plans as yet to transform the company or in terms of severances as yet, it seems as though we're going full speed ahead with this because the minister has now indicated that they need to meet uh, with the unions, the majority union, in order to now talk about any sort of transformation and severance. So this is, this is where I have a problem with the union, because I spoke with the new president of the PSA once, and I think he's a reasonable, intelligent man, and I do have to wonder why is it that they're, how they negotiate, how they communicate, the line that they seem to want to follow is always one of this extreme union ideology. I don't know what else to say because he's describing the whole affair as anarchy. This is, this is in the Guardian's report. Um, they, they, employees should have a legitimate expectation that the process enshrined by a memorandum agreement would have the outcome they expect. And I'm sure he's also questioning with regards to the, the collective bargaining agreement and all of these other things. Well, first of all, 
okay, you have a signed memorandum of agreement. But to what extent is the situation just more and more being revealed to be untenable? And why is it that the union just never, and again, I would like to think that there are stakeholders in the business that keeps their members employed. You don't want to see it fail. So with regards to Carl, that's fine. If Carl falls up, we won't have an airline. That, that would be a problem. But if you understand, no, TSCT, if the SCT falls up, right, um, we will, we'll have other phone providers. But is it that they're looking at Wasa and saying, well, Wasa will never fold? Because people thought that Caribbean Airlines won't fold. People thought that BUE will not fold, sorry. Are they looking at Wasa and saying, no, nah, no, nah, nah. no matter what crap happens in Wasa, the government will pump money to save it, so we will be fine. We will always get our money. We started off with TSCT and you jumped to Wasa. No, but with TSCT, there's alternatives. It's not critical. Right? But WASA is different. WASA is critical. So I don't know if the unions are saying, you know, it's, 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 it will always be saved. Government will always bail it out. And government is saying, we can't always bail you out. Well, if, if we've, uh, since we've moved to WASA, um, the government has actually received the green light to go ahead with the transformation of WASA. We, again, as somebody please inform me. I, I've done my research. I've, I've, I've followed the story and whatnot. I haven't, can, I haven't seen any sort of plan. Or at least, what is the plan in terms of well, transforming Wasa? That is a legitimate so, so some, Somebody please inform me what is the plan for transforming Wasa. It's, it's remain secretive, though the government has made it very well known that we're going to do this. Uh, we need to make it profitable. Ironically, severance is a way that, 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 that I have an issue with here. And I, 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 both ways. But just before we get to that, they have received the green light from the court in order, the industrial court, in order to go ahead uh, because the industrial court dismissed an application for an injunction by the PSA to stop any restructuring of a state entity uh, in its 28 page ruling yesterday. The court recognizes, and I quote, the sole province of the government to formulate policy in this instance on the structure and operations of the authority, and it is the responsibility of the authority to operationalize that policy. That is to inter ally implement it. To affect and operationalize that policy, the authority will have to prepare and formulate its position consistent with and keeping with that policy. Uh, basically, you, you think, understand what they're saying there? Uh, yes, and, and uh, I mean that's 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 very that's a very safe way to put it. Um, and I'm and I'm actually kind of surprised that that's the argument the court will give. Ultimately, I expected the court to be reasonable. It's like bankruptcy is not a team sport. If one side is not necessarily keen on preventing bankruptcy, I'm not really going to can take them as seriously as another side that's saying, hey, we have a problem. We want to try to stop this situation from devolving into a disaster. And by all accounts, it's not as though the union is saying, well, is fine, it's not a disaster, everything is fine, nothing is here. The union isn't saying that. No one is countering the claims that the government is making that we have a problem with the utilities. Okay, maybe with TSCT, they're, 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 they're questioning the claims that the government is making with the issues TSCT has, but not with WASA. Back to what I was saying with severance, though. On one hand, I don't necessarily, yes, it's harsh to, to, to fire people without severance, right? But is it something of a reward for people who are bad at their job? The flip side is, it's not that I want to see them punished, but the severance bill, we saw what it did to the refinery. What, we've, we, we talked about this, I think yesterday, the day before. What are they going to use to secure another loan? Mm. To, to pay off their severance money is TSCT now. Is the new management and the new structure, are they going to just divest themselves of certain assets and use that as collateral for the loan, or is the new entity or the, the existing restructured entity going to be saddled with a whole lot of debt that is, again, this debt, it's not as though it's debt for capital investment that's going to see retains later on. There's no retains here for this debt. This debt is just to try to get, get certain excesses to go away. Well, just to add a bit of spice uh, to this conversation, the government has uh, begun or has signaled its intent to begin consultations with the unions over increasing the retirement age to 65. The unions have now argued that uh, the transformation and restructuring of WASA is anarchy. Who knows what they're going to say in Why relation. Why is it anarchy? Come on. You're acting as though you're surprised. I mean, I guess, uh, to be fair, he's just following the example of the political leaders of the country for years, so. Anyway, folks.
WESN now breaks for news on the hour when routine talking point will open up the phone lines this morning. Stay tuned to the program. Seven is out. All day is in. WESN News on the hour. Every day, we communicate through stories. Stories of ourselves, our challenges, our goals, our experiences, and our aspirations. Storytelling is an art, an art that we have mastered. WESN Film Studios comprises a collaborative team of experts with extensive industry experience locally, regionally, and internationally. The ability of your business to successfully communicate with your preferred audience depends on the strength of the stories you tell. Your vision should be communicated in a high quality, professional, and creative way. From concept to post-production, advertising to film, multi-camera productions, live events, streaming and virtual conferencing, we are WESN Film Studio. Let your own unique voice be heard and your vision realized. Call us today at 628-5835 for your next production. The issue, the continued rise in the price of flour and its impact on the cost of living in Trinidad and Tobago. How should we go about it? I want to ask you what has been revealed to you about the state of vulnerability in the country because of, of this exercise and because of, of what we're going through. Is the government losing the war on the vaccine front? The discussion should revolve around the common good for the greatest number of people in Trinidad and Tobago. How do we inculcate a sense of respect and regard for people who may not be of your own political ilk or persuasion. The, the communities are not being used by political opportunists. So yeah. I, I when the I tables are turned, when the tables are turned, okay. it's the same. It's the same way. Okay, this has been ten questions. I'm Andy Johnson, and we we'll see you next time. Every word, every line, every paragraph depicts a real moment in someone's life. A father, a sister. A mother, a brother. We at Newsday are dedicated to you, the people, and through independent, unwavering journalism, strive to always bring your stories to life. Because your stories are more than just words. Newsday, independent and credible. Don't keep yourself handcuffed. We continue to receive calls from members of the viewing public whose cable provider is flow and cannot receive WESN. We advise that you unfortunately reside on the original flow platform. If you wish to receive WESN's high quality programming, you must contact flow to be upgraded to the new flow Evo platform. Call flow now and demand your upgrade. A reminder from WESN, we urge you to protect yourself and others from the spread of COVID-19. Stay safe by taking some simple precautions. Clean your hands often. Use soap and water or an alcohol-based hand rub. Maintain a safe distance from anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Wear a mask. Don't touch your eyes, nose or mouth. Cover your nose and mouth with your bent elbow or a tissue when you cough or sneeze. Stay at home. If you have a fever, cough and difficulty breathing, seek medical attention. Following the above can help us all to help each other.
Welcome back to the program here on WSN. All right, we start off the conversations this morning by uh, exploring once more the uh, prison break. Uh, we did uh, give an update in relation to uh, the Minister of National Security uh, visiting the dorm of which the five prisoners escaped from. Uh, I still have a lot of questions over that. Our guest this morning, who was supposed to join us, he did confirm yesterday, Sean. Yeah. Unfortunately, it seems as though he wasn't able to make it this morning. So we will contact him after the program uh, to see if there's a possibility of having him on uh, at a later time to give clarification to those uh, questions and concerns. Uh, then we also spoke about a foreign exchange this morning. Again, the, as I said, there's so many different angles that you can look at when trying to assess the situation. And I don't think that, uh, I think we focus very little bit on, on the, the oil and gas imports as to what did the minister. So that's why the conversation will always continue because there are areas that we need to discuss as well that are not focused on by the parliamentarians and those at the helm of government. And uh, finally, we uh, just very briefly spoke about the fact that the government has now received the green light by the industrial court to go ahead with this plans to transform WASA after an injunction or an application for an injunction by the PSE was halted. And also there are plans to restructure TSTT as the management has now put forward uh, the necessary changes to their business model in order to make the utility profitable. Um, the minister stating that they now have to negotiate with the unions on severances. And last but not least, again, just, to, just informing you that the government has signaled its intent to begin consultations with the union in order to raise the retirement age to 65 years old. Anyway, folks, uh, let's give you the opportunity now to call in and join us on the program 623-9376-622-9338. Call in and join us on Talking Point this morning. Have your thoughts, your opinions heard, and let's continue the discussion. This is what we're about. We're about fact, by the way. We're about fact. We're not about political rhetoric. We're not about uh, any, in any way, as they like to call it, uh, Mama Gaina situation. Um, we're not here to spew anything else other than the facts at hand. So when we're calling in, of course, let's be very mindful of that. And bear in mind as well, people have opinions. Everybody has their opinions. Uh, let them express it fairly. I, I hope we are very careful uh, when we're commenting on other callers. Try our very best not to be too insulting. Yeah, I'll just say this with regards to opinion. Just re realize that if we ever give an opinion, we're very careful when we say what we say are facts and, and what we say is opinion. And if we ever get an opinion, that doesn't mean that we believe it to be 100% true and we are married to that opinion and we will fight to the death to ensure that that opinion is believed, the opinion could be wrong. And the events as they unfold could prove the opinion to be incorrect. There are times when our opinion is proven to be along the lines of the truth, not necessarily exactly in line. And there are times when our opinion is completely off base, in part because communication with regards to important issues are not necessarily forthcoming. With regards to the prisons, that was the whole point where we had um, our guest was supposed to give us at least some insight and, on, from his perspective uh, with regards to what happened and how could this situation be prevented. The minister said that they're looking into it. I think generally speaking, though, that's political speak 101. I am looking into problem X and we will try to solve it. You more or less hear that all the time. And do you get the results? Not necessarily. And in that situation, is that a fact? Well, that's, that's something that we have observed to be true more often than not, I would say. Anyway, I, whilst we're waiting for those to join us, um, I was reading this article. I know the Prime Minister uh, held a, a public meeting in San Fernando last night. And as you pointed out, this is where he indicated that uh, uh, he'd like to reopen up the country to full extent, yeah. to, to pre-pandemic levels. He doesn't see why we can't do that. Um, and, and he had quite a bit of commentary, a, a bit disappointing that I didn't hear much on the cabinet reshuffle. He focused a lot more on the opposition um, mm -hmm. and, and, as well as money. But um, he disclosed that uh, Shem Balio Singh, a former senior advisor to the former Prime Minister, Kamala Prasad Bisesa, received close to $1 million from contractors inside the office of the Prime Minister. Uh, and he was stating that there, he also spoke about Guy Griffith, whom he said claimed that the Prime Minister, Keith Rowley, gave him $35 million to go after political opponents. Mm -hmm. So he focused on that. He's saying that there is uh, a specific way that every single cent has to be spent and accounted for by the government. I don't know what that way is because I don't get about that. But the thing is, is that the prime minister is basically stating 
that there are parliamentarians who should be talking to the police. If that is the case, does the government also have a responsibility to ensure that these parliamentarians, if they commit white collar crime, that investigations need to be taken? Because we already know there's interference within the police. We, we already recognize and realize interference yeah. in the police. Yeah. Why don't they push this through with the police? There are a lot of questions there. We do have a caller. I, I don't even know where to begin with that, but we have a caller from Diggle Martin. Good morning, caller. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Good morning. sir. Well, I guess I'm um, calling to, if you all can clarify for me, I don't know if it's possible. Sure. Um, I heard the Minister of Finance saying that he's expecting to increase the forex by getting the money from the um, oil and gas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But on one hand, I heard the Prime Minister, he had, nice when he was, he had the conversation with the public, saying that they would not benefit from that. And so I'm a bit confused there, so that's where they are well, going to get it from. Well, sir, I, I, I truly wish that I can clarify for you. I don't know if, if Sean can, but in listening this to the, the Prime Minister's conversation, uh, and he spoke about that, and then he spoke about the fuel subsidy. Yeah. What the Minister of Finance said yesterday, this is what I was talking to Sean about uh, while the video was being played. It seems as though it's a bit conflicting on the part of, of the Minister and the Prime Minister, and they need to clarify it for us. Because I, I, I really am trying to put it together, but I can't really see how so it's working I out. I think the expectation is for oil to be around $90 a barrel moving forward, <laughs> whenever it might come down, if it comes down. If it stays up well, then... I, I, but I don't think the, the forecast want to see that it will stay up because for most people it will be a benefit. For us, it comes to the caveat that the price of gasoline for vehicles, diesel, etc., that is the, one of the main complications and problems. Um, fuel costs for Caribbean Airlines, etc. But uh, I also heard this morning on another station mm-hmm. from one mile at Bukharan, mm-hmm. which is a person I have great respect for. And mm-hmm. Why she laid out something there, and if that is the true story of this country, I'm very sorry for all the citizens of this country. Yes, so yes, I, I, very, I, very bad picture, and I am. She's a person who tells, does not tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. She tells you what is true here. Yeah. And tell, talks in her mind, and I, boy, I miss her that day, and. So to put all in any <laughs> So call it, the key as, as 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 I believe the key difference to what the Minister of Finance was saying and what the Prime Minister was saying. The Minister of Finance is saying, Well, I expect more forex to be available. And that would be that would be a help. But the Prime Minister was warning, we're not gonna just be rich. The government is not just gonna have money to throw around like it used to. Yeah. So I think that's the key distinction there with regards to their positions. Of course it, it with regards to communication, it would have been better if they did not speak in such a manner that it seemed as though they were conflicting each other. Well, thanks for the information and well, that's my, the best. Well, that's what I believe it to be. Have huh? a great day, Cola. Thank uh, you. Thank yeah. you, Cola. Okay, as I said, uh, I wish we could clarify it for you. We, we can't necessarily clarify yeah. it because it's a, it's a bit confusing what? in itself. It's Sorry. a catch-22, right? So if you're too alarmist, then you could actually have a negative effect on your economy. That might not even be necessary if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're too alarmist and you don't have to be. The flip side, of course, is if you're too positive and, and you get caught being too positive, then people will look at that as a bad sign. And it, and it could either impact you negatively with regards to your political perception from voters, or it could potentially impact the economy negatively because they want to know what is he trying to hide by just giving us generalized positive terms and not enough details. But as I said before, one of the problems with the Minister of Finance and his messaging is generally speaking, everything is fine, this is great, this is improving, we've achieved this, this is going up. You know, if it's rock bottom, anything will be going up. Well, we do have a call on the line. I have to get back to my original question on the uh, Prime Minister's speech last night because it also ties into what the Acting Commissioner of Police is arguing now. So in a bit, we'll get into that. But we do have a call on the line from Shigonas. Good morning, caller. Morning, caller. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. I want to bring up a point I made some time ago when you all said that we never had good government. And what I said at that time was after the Second World War, we had pretty good government. Mm Mm-hmm. But when Dr. Williams came in for his first two terms, and that is important, I didn't say the whole PNM or all when Dr. Williams was here, for the first 
two two. Mm -hmm. That is nineteen fifty six to nineteen sixty five. During that time, we got free education. You get water all over Trinidad outside the municipalities. You get electricity in all the villages. You got, I said, free education. And another, um, one of the greatest things he do, he got back up a base from the Americans, which everybody tried to get. Mm -hmm. right? I haven't seen what changed the scenario. Was two things as far as I'm concerned. What we get independence and the British oversight contrastically. Certain people took advantage of it, like Johnny O'Halloran and Francis Piver and these guys. Mm -hmm. And although Carl Hudson Phillips tried to stop it, he was <laughs> lying and had to leave the party. Mm -hmm. right? and one of the things that complicated it is that it appears that William suffered from that old problem that affects the most brilliant minds in the world, like Napoleon Bonaparte and Churchill and that. That's what they call delusions of grandeur. Mm -hmm. All right? Any questions? Uh, you are not the first individual who I've heard uh, uh, making the point that a lot changed once we gained independence and we lost British oversight. I even heard arguments stating that uh, uh, that was a mistake, that having British oversight would have been beneficial to us. Now, you're not the first person who's made that argument. Well, I I've actually said something similar to this in a, in a different way because I looked at the states and I'm like, well, each city could have state authority to, 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 to backstop them, to, to provide extra resources and extra oversight, but also law enforcement in particular for crime. And then, of course, you have the federal government with the FBI. So for crime especially, to have somebody else that will be on the outside that could come in a lot easier than now when we're independent and, and we have sovereignty and things become a lot trickier. And, but I don't know if the country would have tolerated um, being, being um, subservient to any other nation. I, I really don't. No, no, no. I am not saying you want British oversight. What mm -hmm. you want is oversight. Mm -hmm. Right. So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's and a key. That's like a very important. Carl Hodge Phillips wanted to get proper oversight. Mm -hmm. People like Johnny O'Halloran and Francis Pivot opposed that, and William, because of what I said, he probably had went with them and not Carl. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying the British was who. Right? Yes. Yes. All right. We 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 have another caller. So we All right. Have thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank have you, a Professor. great day. Uh, six two three nine three seven six six two two nine three three. That point is morning. Yes, the point is not about the British and the yeah. British are superior. The point is to have that third party on the outside that could, or or, or somebody that's neutral or objective. That Who's could that going to be? The Privy Council? Uh, I don't know. Good morning, uh, caller from San Fernando. Gentlemen, morning. Good morning. morning. Um, you know, it benefits, and this is my opinion. It benefits a government of this country. We, the government. Um, the people in power or aspiring to power prefer a uh, police service that does not function properly. Mm -hmm. They have never tried to fix this issue. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, let me give you an example. I don't know if you guys remember, you all were younger. Between 2002 and 2010, uh, the government at the time brought in a, an organization called SOUT, S A U T T. Yes. Special Anti Crime Unit of Trinidad Tobago, mm -hmm. which was separate from the police service. And they, that generated so much backlash from the people in opposition at the time that when they got in power, they got rid of it. Mm -hmm. Even the police service had a problem with it. Mm -hmm. And there is no reason why we cannot have another security service in this country designed to fight crime mm -hmm. because the police service have proven that in the most part they're not up to the task they are trying but they're not up to the task just like in other country in, like in the u.s you have fbi you have atf you have regular police you have state police i don't i don't see a reason why we cannot do something else have another agency that because it is really getting out of hand, and we, we have proven that the police service have too much corrupt elements to do the job. Well, Kola, I, uh -huh. I, I, I just would disagree with the last thing you said, it is getting out of hand. I, I'd just like to rephrase that, it is out of okay. hand. 
It has been. Thank you. Thank you, Kola. Thank you, Kola. Good for you. The one thing, though, I'm not sure if it has been completely proven with regards to the corruption level. I actually think that before corruption, there's an issue with regards to resources and will. Well, all our thoughts on resources, call us in, because we we were hearing the beeps, so call us. There are two phone numbers. If you don't get through one, call on the other. But the, the... uh, Acting Commissioner of Police, McDonald Jacob, yeah. has now stated that the TGPS is having a problem with resources, especially with fighting white collar crime. Mm. He stated that yesterday, and this is over the land deeds and, and, and the issues with uh, corruption within the public sector and whatnot, but he said we, we're going to work with the Minister of National Security on this matter. But he says we have a problem with resources. Last night, the Prime Minister stated the Minister of Finance approved US $18 million in 2021 for the pursuit of white collar crime. Where has that US 18 million gone to? What have we done with that US 18 million? No, well, million? Uh, is that going to the TTPS? Where is that money being spent? He said it, for the pursuit of white collar right. crime. I don't think, I don't think that's being pumped into the judiciary. I don't think that, I think that's not what the Minister of Finance would have approved it for. We, we do have a call from Diego Martin. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, hi guys. Good morning. Thank morning, you. morning. Um, can I switch a little bit to the war, please? Sure. Uh-huh, go ahead. Yeah, because um, we're seeing a uh, Putin has finally agreed to eight humanitarian corridors, Mm -hmm. even though because of their liars, they've just intercepted, I think, 11 buses or so on another one, which was going to collect um, people. Mm. And Mariupol is now being besieged from the sea, which just adds another layer. Mm -hmm. And just as, you know, we were thinking, at least the experts were thinking, Russia, Dmitry Peskov has said that Russia is not going to rule out nuclear weapons, which is beyond scary. And um, I think two interesting things, though, would be that Putin didn't think he was going to create a stronger alliance, which mm-hmm. I think he has between EU and NATO. NATO. Mm-hmm. And another thing which I would like us to get into sometimes, if you don't mind, is um, we're actually seeing live propaganda unfold here. Because... In my mind, I've been asking, I wonder what Alexei Navalny was thinking about all of this. And now they've come up with four fake charges to keep him in prison for nine more years when his two and a half was ending. Yes. And I mean, all the other things that Putin is putting out to his people, we're seeing all of those conspiracy theories unfold. Mm-hmm. And um, eventually, though, the one, I don't know if you call it heartening or whatever, eventually the, he's going to be brought up by the ICC because they've started to gather evidence. Yeah. That's all. All of that takes another hundred years, there, eh? And he might live to be 500, but we don't know. So <laughs> Thank you very much. It. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very uh, much. I think with regards to the war in Ukraine, the, the one interesting thing is all signs seem to be pointing on the fact that if it continues to how it's going and Belarus does not get involved, Eventually, Russia literally, and again, we come back to resources, whether it's personnel or material, they will just run out of resources at the rate of things are going. And the reports are not clear with regards to losses, but I've seen enough to think that even if some are true, it's not going how the way Putin expected. And at least in that part of the world, it, he, he might just be forced to stay, uh, uh, at a stop because he can't continue and hopefully nuclear weapons just... Things don't get that crazy. We have another caller. We do have another caller line from Tigger Martin. Good morning, caller. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Small and Mr. Shah. Good morning. morning. And if I, if, if I caused some concern yesterday, I apologize for that. Okay, let me start. And That's I think fine. people shying away from the TPPS. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say it here. Is the TPPS a rotten organization? We have to be pragmatic. Because from time of removal, it has been put on the block for chopping, mm-hmm. for fixing, mm-hmm. and the service itself, the main players within the TPS, has basically aborted any transformation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we have to ask why. We had the what tea, we had this, we had that, we had the, this report, Matras Coffee report, all of those things, and it hasn't been fixed. So, on, uh, uh, and I'm saying, until we could fix this police service to get them to do what they're doing, then we going down the road to hell. Mm-hmm. Look, for example, and you know, I, I like that punk, but 
I'm not hearing my other colleague who used to comment on giving information to TPPS and they never investigated. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. I am reading in the newspaper again. There was a search, a warrant executed on the president of the Trinidad and Tobago Body Bidder Federation. The police did that. Eh? That, mm -hmm. that happened in January. And she has brought a lawsuit against the police. And it appears, I am a Bush lawyer, it appears <laughs> they were using a audit report that was null and void. Mm. How can, and if this is so, how can they justify that search warrant? Who, under whose instructions, they want to bring up light sports again? If it is squashed by a high court saying it's not null and void, and you're using it to execute, to dig up, to find information. It reminds me about email gate, an email that you try to justify with the contents. You remember um, all of these people who are running all over? How can you have this common sense? Now, the other thing I'm going to say in this economy, um, our economy and how we manage it, is do we have a blood economy? And why I'm saying we depending on a war mm -hmm. in Ukraine, mm -hmm. to get higher prices to move forward. What kind of think, mind thinking is this? If that war never happened, where we were, were, would have gone? We wouldn't have generated additional foreign exchange. So what this tells me, we are, our thinking is we in, in the box still and we can't think outside to generate uh, revenue. Yeah. I mean, there is a hard statement I'm making, but that is pragmatic. Yeah. We are hoping that this continues and we'll get more uh, things. If for one reason, everything honky dory get back to normal tomorrow, we're still in the, in the big hole, mm. no revenue. Right. So our leadership is, is basically, um, I wouldn't say, clueless, have no imagination. I think cool. have no imagination. To generate I, revenue. Go on, have a nice day. Have a nice day. Uh, I understand what you're saying in relation to the Ukrainian-Russian war, but uh, we have to be careful how we freeze it. We're not depending on, on the war for the price of oil. Well, we're benefiting. We are, we are benefiting. But uh, what I'm saying, yes, no, I understand what, what, what they call the point. We're not involved. But we, in we need to just be careful how we yeah. put it across, how we see things. Now, now, with the police, maybe it goes back to what our, our previous scholar said, have another organization. The question is, do we want to try to fix the police, uh, full restructure, like what ha happened between Bui to Cal, or do you want to replace with a brand new organization? Not just go, well, we rebrand it into from, from one name to another name, but we go brand new organization, um, build it from the ground up, have it function very differently, and, and, and hopefully that fixes. I think it goes back to some of the problems we have with the public sector and how labor, public labor is managed. Well, I think that's part of the problem. As we uh, wrap things up and conclude the program to the uh, our, our good friend from Diego Martin who called in to speak about the Russia-Ukrainian war, just to let you know it in terms of uh, Putin facing the ICC, it's going to be a hell of a job for the ICC to actually get Putin to stand up in their court. Yeah, but there is, there is a bit of a catch anyway. You see, Russia in 2016 actually uh, withdrew its membership uh, to the ICC. So the ICC actually has no jurisdiction over Russia. Furthermore... <laughs> Uh, Ukraine is not a member of the ICC. Now, while the ICC has uh, oversight over war crimes and crimes against humanity, um, there is a bit of a loophole. Though those two nations are not members of the ICC, uh, Ukraine actually signed an article. I can't remember the exact name of the article at the top of my head right now, but uh, the article allows for the ICC to have jurisdiction over specific cases. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're not a member, we're not a full member, we're not fully subscribed, but there is in our constitution, one clause that says the ICC will have jurisdiction over specific cases, and that is the loophole. So the thing is the ICC can, they probably can prosecute. However, the catches between Russia and Ukraine not being members and getting Putin to stand up well, in court. So the main thing there is ultimately, if he doesn't want to go, what's going to force him to go? You're going to have to do sanctions and a war. Oh, wait, they're already at that stage. So at this point, the ICC is somewhat academic. Yeah. 
Well, folks, uh, that's all the time we have uh, for this morning's edition of Talking Point. Thank you very much to everyone who called in and contributed uh, to the program. Again, if you uh, joined us late in the program, Karen was not able to join us this morning. She had a pre-existing, well, a prior engagement, um, and hopefully later on this week she will join us. Uh, but... As the conversation always goes, I'm keen to wishing you all the very best. Remember, we're still in a pandemic, though we're more or less operating at pre-pandemic levels. Fingers crossed that things continue to work out as they are even improve and get better. Sean Michael Small, always great having you here. And as we continue the conversations. Just want to say, people, do your own work yourselves. Get your own opinion. Inform yourself wisely. Inform yourself wisely. That, that's key to that last statement. <laughs> we could debate that whole statement, but we're out of time. <laughs> anyway, folks, I'm Keith Shaw. That's Sean Michael Small. This has been Talking Point on WESN. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.